devoted to Albert Hirschman, his intellectual legacy, and his influence on today's scholarship. We will explore several fields, several topics, different approaches. Albert Hirschman's message, a bias for hope, seems extremely powerful and relevant today. And we have chosen it as a guidance, as a fil rouge of the international workshop organized by our center. Albert Hirschman has spread ideas across different areas, different continents. He has inspired scholarly and policy projects, including the creation of research programs such as ours at the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy at the Grad Institute, and also close to us with the Colorni Hirschman Institute in Rome, at IRMEA uh, in Aix Marseille, but also in the United States, and importantly in Latin America. This is the seventh year of activity of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, which was created at the Grad Institute in 2017 and supported by the Gnosis Foundation. I would like to thank its president, Dr. Peter Kalansis, for making this possible in Geneva. This roundtable will discuss Albert Hirschman's seminal insights and how they enable to grasp specific research and policy issues. This is the public event of the international workshop convened by our center in collaboration with Oxford University, RedGov, and supported by the Société Suisse des Américanistes, de l'Académie Suisse des Sciences Humaines et Sociales. A big thank you to Janina Welp, my colleague at the center, and Lawrence Whitehead for organizing the workshop. This is the first meeting of this year, organized collaboratively with Oxford University. And there will be a second conference in Oxford later this year in November. We are glad to welcome you, Lawrence, to the Institute as a speaker in the event, as well as Santiago, a warm welcome to you. And it's a great pleasure to have you, Shalini, back with us uh, at the center. And finally, welcome to the participants in the workshop who are joining us from different universities in Europe and beyond. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists, uh, Santiago Gershunov. Professor Gershunov teaches political theory at Madrid Carlos III University. He specializes in the study of historical mutation in the public sphere, especially since the appearance of the internet. His latest book on the subject is Ironia On, a Defense of Mass Public Conversation, published in 2019. In his PhD work on Anna Harend and Benjamin, Benjamin Constant, uh, Albert Fishman's political thought plays a fundamental role. Uh, Santiago Gashonov is also the editor of the latest Spanish version of the Rhetoric of Reaction, and he is preparing a new Spanish edition of Shifting Involvements. Shalini Randeria is rector and president of the Central University, Central European University in Vienna. Her career as a sociologist and social anthropologist spans across different institutions across Europe. She was rector of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and a professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute, where she founded and director, directed the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy. Professor Andelia holds the Excellence Chair at the University of Bremen, where she leads a research group on soft authoritarianisms. She has published widely on the anthropology of globalization, law, the state, and social movements, with a regional focus on India. Her influential podcast series, Democracy in Question, was launched in 2021 and is now in its eighth season. Lawrence Whitehead is a senior research fellow in politics at Nuffield College, Oxford University, and until 2015, he was senior fellow of the college. During 2005-2006, he served as acting warden there. In 2011-2012, Professor Whitehead served as senior proctor of the university. Among his many books are Latin America, a new interpretation published in 2006, and with a revised updated edition in 2010, Democratization, Theory and Experience, published in 2002, 
His most recent edited publications include Let the People Rule, Direct Democracy in the 21st Century, published in 2017, edited jointly with Saskia Root and Janina Velp, and Illiberal Practices, Territorial Variants Within Large Federal Democracies, published in 2016, which he co-edited with Jacqueline Berendt. I would like to start the discussion by asking you some biographical questions. Um, my first round of questions to, to you, Shalini, uh, Santiago, and, and Lawrence, would be about your personal encounters. How has Albert Hishman influenced your academic and the scholarly journey. Let me start with you, Shalini. How did you meet Albert Hirschman? Can you highlight uh, one of his <laughs> ideas or concepts that has particularly influenced your work? So thank you very much, Christine. It's wonderful to be back. Um, let me start with uh, two biographical quick remarks and then say something about one idea of his, which uh, was uh, the uh, founding idea for the center as well. So my father presented me a copy. Uh, my father was an economist. He presented me a copy of Exit Voice and Loyalty when I was 16. I must admit, quite honestly, I didn't understand most of the book. <laughs> but luckily, uh, as uh, you know, um, serendipitous and happy encounters in life can be. In 1991, I was honored to be a fellow fellow of Albert Hirschman at the uh, Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, at the Institute of Advanced Study. It was the first time that Albert had come back to uh, Berlin for a longer stay, the city of his birth. And uh, it was for him a very, very important personal occasion. And I was living in Berlin at that time. <clears throat> so I took him around Berlin uh, for uh, several weeks. We went back to see where his family house was. We went to see where he went to school in the Französische Gymnasium uh, in Berlin. And so over the course of the year that we spent at the Institute of Advanced Study, we had occasion for many, many conversations. But I should admit, very honestly, uh, 1991 was when I was much, much younger than now. I was very much in awe of Albert. So I now regret not having asked him many things I would have loved to have asked him. But I was listening more than I was asking. Now, I think the, <clears throat> the reason I want to choose the concept of exit voice and loyalty as the most powerful idea which influenced some of my work and which influenced us in the founding of the center is twofold. Mr. Kazantzis is here. And when we set up the center, the question that he asked was, the center should not be named after the donors. The center should not be named after the foundation. The center should be named after somebody <clears throat> whose work we can guarantee is being read by everybody in the Institute. And when I was told that that was the challenge, it took me 24 hours and I came back and said, Albert Hirschman. Albert Hirschman for two reasons. One, because I think all the disciplines in the Institute should be reading Albert Hirschman's work if they are not. And secondly, because I felt a center on democracy is something which really uh, incorporates the most significant um, idea and actions in Albert Hirschman's life. If there's one thing that he devoted his life to, it was the fight against fascism. And uh, for me, that was something uh, so he may not be, for many people, the most important theorist of democracy, but I think his entire life was devoted to two things, as he says in an interview. He says, quite late in life, he says in the interview, there are two ideas which have lasted through time from the 1930s to the 2000s when he's um, uh, giving this interview. One is the idea, he said, a certain idea of social justice, and he said, a trust in democratic 
values and practices. And I think um, he's very right on both, and I thought it would be a very, very fitting tribute to somebody whom I hold in the greatest of esteem to uh, name the center after him. Now, Exit Voice and Loyalty. The book originally is very much about um, dissatisfied consumers. The book is very much about how do consumers react when um, they are, and it's written very much against uh, those economists who see competition as the solution to all economic problems, because he's saying competition leads to exit. Yeah, you, you are unsatisfied with something as a consumer, and you will exit the firm. And his idea is, no, voice can be as important a mechanism for correction as exit. Much, much later, the idea began to be applied by others, and later in 1991, uh, 92, by Albert himself, to political questions. When he started thinking about the, how the collapse of the communist regime and the communist uh, the breakdown of the wall, and how East Germany collapsed. And then he does something very, very interesting. In the book itself, he says, you have three options as a consumer. You are either loyal to the firm, you, uh, it's the affection, your belonging, your strong sense of identification with the firm, which will keep you there. If you're dissatisfied, you exit, you leave, you go to the competitor, or else your option would be to voice dissent. And in the book, it's, it's an oscillation between exit and voice, or it's even an opposition. And in the essays he writes after 1990, 91, 92, when he's rethinking the fall of the East German regime, he says, I am now beginning to think it need not be an opposition. Exit and voice can be complementary strategies. And he's applying it now not to firms, but to politics, to citizen action, to collective action by citizens. And it's a wonderful essay which he writes, and then if you remember the title of the book that comes much later, he calls it uh, Propensity for Self-Subversion. Uh, uh, and this is where he says, I'm not going to say this is self-criticism, this is a term which the Marxists have ruined for me, but I'm going to call it a propensity for self-subversion using the same title as a bias for hope, Bias has a negative connotation, subversion has a negative connotation. I want to turn these words around, give them a positive connotation, and say, this is the opportunity to rethink our ideas, and I'm rethinking my idea in the light of historical experience. So he has no difficulty pointing out that, not that the idea was wrong of the opposition from exit and voice, so that the more exit, less voice, or the more voice, less exit, which was the original idea. So he's saying not that the idea was wrong. What I'm doing is telling you the conditions under which I'm limiting the conditions now under which that idea held in that particular set of circumstances. So what he's doing is he's specifying context. And he's insisting that context matters, specificity matters, something which economists don't usually take into consideration. So as an anthropologist, felt very much at home with this idea that context and specifics and particular cases and the unusualness of a case matter. And for me, the question of exit voice and loyalty was a very important question in my own work. It had a lot of resonance because I was thinking at that time about varieties of voice. And for Albert Hirschman, a lot of the question of voice was voice at the ballot box, elections, participation, and also protest. I was looking at a very specific kind of voice in my own work those days, and with that I'll stop in India. I was looking at the poor in India, those who are powerless, those who are dispossessed, the use of the court, the use of the law as the arena in which to exercise voice. So I started our work at the center saying, we need to think about strategies of exit, we need to think about ideas of loyalty to political parties, etc. in democracy, 
But we also need to think about voice and varieties of voice because voice is being exercised in all democracies, old and new, on the street. So you are getting in democracies people in between elections in huge demonstrations where you would actually think they've voted for the parties that they want. Why are they all out on the street? And you get a lot of exercise of voice in courts. And this was the phenomenon I started looking at, the shift between the juridical domain and the political domain and the way in which they were implicated with one another in the, uh, the way in which accountability, accountability was demanded, social justice was striven for, and people decided to protest. Which arenas do you use when and why? How do you oscillate between arenas? And what is the relationship between these? So uh, I think that's uh, where I want to uh, just stop with personal recollections. I have many. <laughs> we'll ask you in the, in the Q&A. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, Santiago, I'd like to ask you the same question. How did you get to know advertisements work? And how and when did you start reading him? And how influential was he on your journey? Well, first, uh... Thank you very much for the invitation, Shanina, the center. And it's an honor to be with here with Shalini and, and Lawrence. I'm very happy to be here <laughs> uh, talking about Hirschman. Um, well, I, I I I wasn't so lucky as as Shalini. I I, I don't I didn't knew Hirschman personally. I would love that, but but it was not the case. But I have the same story. My father was uh, studying here a lot, and, and and when I was very young, I I, I wasn't uh, 16. I was much younger. But my father, he he didn't give me exit boys. He was not so <laughs> perverse. But he he was always talking about Albert, about uh, his special intelligence. And my father was an, is an economic historian. So, um, so I, have, I have heard about him a lot. And, and his name symbolically, in my, it was linked in my head, in, in my mind to uh, incredible intelligence. That, that was my, but uh, it took me many years then uh, to actually read a book of his, it was um, like, I think, 20 years more uh, la later uh, when, when I, while, I, while I was doing research for my doctoral thesis uh, that I came across a book that I did not even know by name uh, since it's, it is certainly not one of the most famous Hirschman's uh, books. Uh, and it is shifting, shifting, shifting involvement. <laughs> uh, sometimes shifting involvement is known as a minor book with some problems. It, it has to do with uh, its reception in the moment and, and Albert's uh, attitude for in, for, um, in front of that reception. But it's an incredible book. Um, the, the reading dates with me. First, because uh, Hirschman was thinking on very similar problems to those I had in mind. And even he was putting focus on a classic discussion that was exactly one of the cores of my own work. I am referring to the discussion between Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Benjamin Constant. By the way, two Swiss uh, thinkers, <laughs> one of them precisely Geneva. And the discussion was a discussion around the idea of modern citizenship and its problematic uh, relationship with the idea of ancient citizenship. That was one, one of my, the, the course of my investigation and Hirschman in shifting involvements uh, explains uh, that discussion in a very um, singular way. Um, finally, uh, his arguments at the end of the book around the problem of the lack of expressiveness of the vote ended up being fundamental for my own work's conclusions. I, 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 I really um, took his argument to, to conclude my work, 
it was like, like that. Um, from then on, I have another history, a personal history with him. I, I, uh, I'm not a typical scholar. I have done a lot of things. I was a, a bookseller for a lot of years in, in Madrid, in, in a neighborhood full of um, political and syndical militants with, Mar with a Marxist formation. And, and, and um, I, I organized some reading groups on the passion and the interest. So <laughs> it was very interesting. They, they were, they, I, I, I am sure that uh, I, I, that, that I attracted a lot of new Hirschmanites to the course because they they were I think they, they were very interested in in another uh, in another in another explanation of the origin of the of capitalism in triumph different from the from the typical um, original accumulation explanation in in, Mar, in Marx capital um, an explanation the Hishman explanation that is more of the story of cultural mutation of ideas than that I'm, than a mere uh, material transformation of history. And finally, uh, in, in the in what personal my personal relation with Hishman, then some years later I, I started working as an editor. And I promoted and directed a, a new Spanish edition of the Rhetoric of Reaction. Mm -hmm. I changed the title, the, the Spanish title, that was strange title. It was instead of La Retorica Reaccionaria, that is the literal uh, translation. It was some a bit strange. It was Retoricas de la, de la Intransigencia. There is a history beside that. It was... Uh, it was Albert who wanted to change it, yeah. but I have I, I wrote an epilogue to this edition explaining why I prefer the original, <laughs> not Albert's decision. That's very interesting. It's a, a long discussion, but it's between titles. And now I, I am preparing a, a a new Spanish edition of Shifting Involvements. That was my first law with with Hirschman, and in this time. Again, I am changing the title because, again, in Spanish it has a very strange, uh, and I think a wrong. I think Charlene needs will be will, will understand this. In, in Spanish, it's not known as shifting involvements, but as interés privado y acción pública. The title is the subtitle. It is mm, called private in, interest. so the oscillation movement is lost in the title. So in the new edition, I'm trying to. Change that, and I am, and, I, and I'm naming it like compromisos variables, shifting involvements. Mm. So the oscillation movement is kept in the title. That's that's the idea. Uh, and to what idea I will I will mark specially. Oof, there's a lot. I, as I said. Uh, all, all, all his uh, research around the problem of uh, the lack of expressiveness in both was very info important for me to understand um, that there's a consequence of that uh, lack of expressiveness that it is a, like a repressed desire of expression that keeps like remanent when both uh, functions as a ceiling, as a top of, of, um, of expression. And that desire, repressed desire, that's my word, not, not Albert's mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's something that has a lot to do with our um, digital mass public conversation. What happens, <coughs> is it has to do with uh, the liberation of uh, repressed desire. That's 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 my idea <laughs> taking it from albert's research around uh, inexpressiveness of both 
But I, I, I would mark too that the, the two um, classic, um, most famous triads, exit voice, loyalty, and perversity, futility, and jeopardy in the rhetoric of reaction uh, has an incredible uh, vitality today. You can use them to analyze, I think, any political or sociological phenomenon. It's, you, for example, with, with uh, perversity, futility, and jeopardy, uh, if you take any change of laws uh, um, regarding new minorities, uh, alleged be, uh, minorities, when, when you see the reaction of conservatives, it's very easy to localize perversity, futility, and jeopardy arguments when they are against the, these new laws or new rights for, for minorities. That, that's, so they are incredibly valid, no? they are still valid. And with exit voice loyalty, as you were, as you were saying, um, you can analyze a lot of things, like I, I think you, I, I heard you uh, talking about migration movements yes. and such as, but for example, I think in uh, political coalitions, ruptures in political parties, what has happened uh, in Spain with Podemos, uh, you, can, you can analyze uh, an, an important uh, political figure in Spain, Inigo Arrejón, attitude, and you can say it was exit, it was voice, it was loyalty, you can, you can analyze, <laughs> it was a combination of what, what was uh, or now in Argentina, the strange coalition that is in, what, what did Millet do? It was, it was exit, it is voice, it's both, loyalty, it's not. Loyalty, it's <laughs> loyalty. <laughs> so I think that, uh, that ideas are very vital and valid and, and I recommend everyone to read uh, Rhetoric of Reaction and, and Exit Voice Loyalty are very useful today. I, I, uh, Thank you very much, Santiago. Uh, Lawrence, uh, what is your story? How did you meet also Albert Hirschman and how did he influence your own work? Well, thank you for having me on this panel. And it's really very interesting to hear the first two um, presentations because mine is a bit different and uh, reflects the fact that Hirschman had powerful influences across a remarkably wide range of uh, disciplines and themes. So uh, in the 1960s, I was studying philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford. And my biggest interest was uh, the economics of development. And the first time I came across Hirschman, it was reading his book, uh, The Strategy of Economic Development, which was a very um, inspiring and uh, refreshing alternative to um, the dominant literature on development that was uh, available to us at this time. I was thinking as an economist, and it was a book for economists, um, but I was thinking as an economist interested in historical processes where you had to have a sense of economic history, if you like, and strategy of economic development was very uh, dynamic from that point of view, rather than uh, a mechanistic, unilinear uh, in its approach. It was actually, to put it in summary terms, it was a disequilibrium approach to development in contrast to the um, static or the cumulative unilinear models that were prevalent. And that not only was a general approach that I found very stimulating and helpful, but it also opens the door to a whole series of specific questions that you can then investigate uh, both historically, uh, in particular contexts, and so on. And I was searching for how to go beyond the generalities of ideas that were fashionable in the 1960s about developing countries to, um, as it were, uh, 
realities that I could gain access to, that I could use to check my vague and general models that I was being given in university. So the next thing that came for me from, from Hirschman, and to me it's a very influential book, and it's not one of the books that you mostly quote on the Hirschman thinkers pay that much, much attention to. It's called Journeys Towards Progress. And that did, for me, a tremendous service because uh, well, it had a powerful effect on my subsequent development. At a certain point, Hirschman spent a lot of time in Colombia and he um, tried to get to grips with obstacles to development and phenomena about development as they um, interfered with or characterized or reshaped um, political and economic possibilities in Colombia and then in other Latin American countries. And so the broad theory of disequilibrium economics, which he'd been providing, was then followed through with a series of, I would say, concrete policy-making historical case studies, which were highly contextual and made me aware of just how uh, close to, how much closer to reality you needed to get in order to test these generalizations. So the book has three case studies, and these were all very powerful for me. One, and they're all in the broad framework of reform. Right? One was looking at land reform in Colombia. Second was looking at inflation, monetary management in Chile. And the third was looking at dam building and um, uh, water, dr I mean, drought management in northeast of Brazil. So here we are, we're not now talking about very aggregate, you know, how does, how do you get the rate of growth up by, how do you do the takeoff, as R Rusto used to say, uh, into sustained growth, a very aggregate level. We're talking about what do you do when uh, the largest region in Br Brazil can't grow because there isn't enough water and people's agriculture is held back by the lack of water? Or what do you do in Colombia when uh, the uncertainties and the conflicts about land ownership between uh, large landowners and, and, and small uh, uh, cultivators um, is making it impossible for either side, really, to act like standard rational economic actors. So he, he has, a, he, he, I was inspired by the, the broad book and then especially inspired by these concrete examples. And the three concrete examples in Journeys Towards Progress are then followed by, because he was always able to get close to reality and then to back up, back off and think more theoretically. A really interesting and important chapter, which I probably didn't take fully on board at the time, but which comes back to me now, which is chapter five of Journeys Towards Progress, which is about models of reform mongering. How do you actually, given these kind of contextual problems, and these specific obstacles to development, how do you avoid... I mean, one thing he wanted to avoid in his work on Latin America was, uh, he, he particularly denounced, it's called fracasomania. That's to say, uh, fatalistic, no matter what we try, it's going to fail. That's one. And the alternative is a sort of um, voluntarist, um, we're, no, we're going to, we've got the truth, we've got the one and only way out, and we're going to impose this on everybody else and disregard any objections and obstacles. He wanted, and the journeys towards progress, is, as the title suggests, exploring how can we find some terrain in between those two impossible extremes which could lead to better outcomes, not perfect solutions, but um, better outcomes that were legitimate and politically feasible. That, that's the question. That he um, and the, 
The truth is, for me, that I'm not saying that this is just because of reading Hirschman, but it's relevant to what then happens to me. I was, my first job was to be university lecturer in the economics of Latin America at a time when Latin American studies was being set up in Oxford. And uh, the economics of development was one of the key parts to it. I went to do field work in Latin America, as a result of which my conclusion was, well, a lot of the problems are not so much the ones that the economists are telling me about, they're political problems. And when I came back from Latin America, I stayed doing Latin American studies, but I became a political scientist. I, I migrated, fortunately for me, because I could not have kept up with the increasingly professional and technical direction that the economics discipline took, which took it further and further away from the economics of development that interested me. Um, and so I became, I, I shifted to comparative politics. So that's a little bit, the, the early ideas of Hirschman in my early formation. Um, and I stress that, as you were saying, he, context was a very important part of what he did. And for me, but the most important thing was to say, I need to know about some context. I shouldn't be going around saying, uh, oh, uh, the World Bank solution or the Washington consensus model is. I, I should be grappling w w with the real situation of difficulties in particular countries. Well, that's what I got out of him. So uh, I move and I become a political scientist focusing on Latin America. And it's in that context that I first came across him in person, because uh, I was therefore invited, well, don't, my details, the details of me don't matter. The Wilson Center, Washington at the Smithsonian Institution, created its own Latin American program. And the priority that was chosen for the Latin American program was uh, how could I'd call them dictatorship, but we'll call them authoritarian rule, how, that we had all these dictatorships, of the national security, military regimes, and so on, all over Latin America. Uh, how could they be um, reformed and opened up and liberalized in order to achieve democratic outcomes? Following, you know, what was happening in Spain and Portugal and so on by the time the Latin American program was set up. So, uh, I knew something about Spain and Portugal, and I'd actually done specific work on Greece, so I had some European insight into this. But I was a Latin Americanist, and the Latin American program set this up as its major program. And the intellectual guidance for the transitions from authoritarian rule in Latin America and Southern Europe project, that's the project I'm talking about, uh, was uh, a, a board of people chaired by Albert Hirschman. And so, in a little, I was a very junior person, and Hirschman was a very grand chair of a very grand committee, which also included, you know, Fernando Enrique Cardoso and so on. Um, but the outcome was I was hired by the Wilson Center to um, manage the implementation of the transitions project, which became it's quite a well-known text in. Uh, Comparative Politics of Democracy, the Transitions from Authoritarian Rule Project, which basically, um, now, Hirschman, uh, what, what most people remember in political science about the Transitions from Authoritarian Rule Project is we, um, we were confronted with uh, two standard ways of thinking about what happens with authoritarian rule. Uh, one is you have a revolution and with a bit of, you know, like in Sandinistas or something or other, the authoritarians are overthrown by an uprising from below. Uh, um, and the alternative um, uh, is that you can't really change it. Now, the, the transition from authoritarian rule um, approach was, well, there have to be intermediate, second best negotiated processes that can uh, get you out of this dilemma. 
they're not guaranteed to work, but let's theorize what they might be like and what might come about, drawing a little bit of encouragement from the fact that in Southern <coughs> Europe, it was not actually proving the case that negotiations were uh, peaceful transitions to more liberal and more open democratic outcomes were in fact coming about. So this is remembered in the literature as the strategic interactions approach to democratization. That's what we stood for. And generally, the credit for it is given to us, I mean, but in particular, I'd say to Guillermo O'Donnell, whose contribution was to say, well, you have to distinguish between hardliners and softliners in the authoritarian regime, and you have to uh, distinguish between moderates and radicals among the Democrats, and you have to look for the conditions in which the softliners and the, the moderates can find common ground and can push the intransigence at either side away. And I think, uh, you know, Guillermo deserves credit for that, and it was a very important thing that he did. But if you read uh, chapter five of Journeys Towards Progress, the first model on the contriving of reform, Hirschman had already 10 years before um, set out really basically what I'm describing. He doesn't get credit for it. I mean, he was the chairman of the committee that appointed the people and so on. But his name does not appear and in fact, the, the, the Transitions volume does not really say much about Hirschman. Hirschman, after all, was an economist, this was politics, etc. But the truth is that uh, among the many different things that he inspired, this is one of the things he inspired. So that, uh, I, uh, that led to eventually me meeting Hirschman more personally. He came to Oxford after the project was published and so on, and I showed him around the college, and we had a very nice day together. And, um, uh, oh, what, before I come back, one of the other concepts which is much celebrated in the Transitions from Authoritarian Rule uh, volume is thoughtful wishing. You see, the argument would be, why are you trying to... Um, spit in the face of reality uh, and imagine that these authoritarian rule regimes can just be got rid of, uh, when it's very unlikely that that will happen. And the answer, which is credited to Abe Lowenthal, the founder of the Latin American program, is this concept of thoughtful wishing. You know, it's not wishful thinking, which is to say, <laughs> you've got to be grounded you've got to be, uh, you, your, your beliefs and your thinking must not be distorted by um, a prior commitment that it's got to, you know, naive prior commitment that it's got to come out all right. Um, but thoughtful wishing means you're allowed to be, uh, you're allowed to have uh, a, a normative value standpoint from which you approach a problem. Now, when you get to the problem, you've got to be extremely objective and clear and uh, 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 dispassionate about the evidence and the, the logic of what you're doing. But you're allowed to choose the subject from the standpoint you have, and that can be a normative uh, standpoint. So that's what the thoughtful wishing phrase refers to. But again, Although Abe Lowenthal is the person who gets the credit for thoughtful wishing, the book called A Bias for Hope had appeared before thoughtful wishing. And it says the same thing. It's exactly, you know, in a more, in, in, in a more elaborated way. Uh, so fin finishing with my personal experience of um, showing Hirschman around Oxford and he, he, you know, he was a very, very impressive man in various ways. But there was one thing that he said, just a casual aside of his, aside from him, which I'd like to end this section on, which seems to me, you know, it's so simple and so clear and so uh, easily not, um, not taken into account not only in economics, in politics, in social science, in philosophy, and so on. He said, I forget quite what it was that 
brought this uh, comment about. He said, I find it so amazing that academics and scientists and social scientists and so on in general have such difficulty in contemplating the, the reality that um, a single cause can produce two equal and opposite effects. A very simple idea. Once you have that as your uh, clue to uh, analytical uh, approach to all kinds of problems, um, it opens up doors and it uh, steers you away from uh, uh, rigid models in a way which I would say is most productive and which is one of his most valuable uh, legacies uh, of his work. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, you have all um, discussed a series of key concepts, key keywords in uh, Hirschman's work. And this, uh, this concept can be uh, related to his uh, life journey, I would say, and uh, we can discuss that further. And these are also concepts that have been uh, explicited and proposed in a very open and direct mode in the case of the uh, dyad or triad, exit voice, exit voice and loyalty. They have been applied uh, widely to many contexts and situations. And these are also concepts that, uh, or categories, that refer to uh, other concepts that are implied in uh, Albert Hirschman's thought. And they also derive, as you pointed out, uh, Lawrence, from a certain way of looking at social reality. Uh, so my, my second round of, of questions to you would be to turn to this aspect uh, and to ask you what are for you uh, some defining elements in um, Albert Hirschman's approach, uh, defining elements, but also puzzling elements and orthodox elements. Would you like to, to start, uh, Santiago? Well, yes, I, I will link with, with the final idea of Florence was the, the his fight uh, to not to have rigid models uh, of thinking mm, and and the way uh, the, the 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 strange way in, in he combines speculative philosophical thinking and empirical thinking and that of being uh, very keeping looking around for for details that can change uh, his his way of thinking. I emph I emphasize above all Hirschman's use of purely speculative philosophical thinking in the context of social sciences. In general, I believe that a great Hirschmanian heritage is the freedom to mix disciplines whenever the argument, the little idea inspiring each, each text requires it. Because we know that uh, Hirschman was allergic to big ideas in the sense of globalizing or totalizing ideas that pretend to account for the whole of reality. He believed rather in small ideas that often emerge from empirical observation or from the implementation of real policies. From that point of view, his commitment was empirical rather than speculative. But once the engine of thought was set in motion, starting from a small idea, Hirschman was able to use both quantitative studies aspiring to be evidence-based and classic of and classics of speculative thinking. For example, in the case of shifting involvements, I am repeating myself, <laughs> but I love this book. <laughs> it, it seems that on uh, his trip to Russia in the late 70s, he was struck by the swing towards private consumption by ordinary citizens, right in the place that should be at the heart of public engagement. He was surprised by how 
people in, in was the Soviet Union in that time was um, was interest in private consumption. But from this small idea, philosophy classics such as Rousseau, or Constant, or De Mestre, Burke, Locke, Hegel, if you think in the rhetoric of reaction, come into action in his books. Start from this small idea, in an observ a little observation in, in a trip, or, and then he starts with philosophical, speculative, classic thinking. Um, I do not mean to say that Hishman was indifferent to the quantitative contribution uh, of, so of the social sciences. We know that it was the disappointment already in his youth with the great economic theories, both Marxism and Keynesianism, that led him to join the anti-fascist resistance in Italy, France and Spain, more as an expert in the interpretation of economic data than as a political theorist or a philosopher. But in the development of his major books, philosophical speculation is undeniably at the core of his arguments, always. The, the central arguments of his most import, in, important books, Exit Voice, Loyalty, The Passions and the Interest, The Rhetoric of Reaction, are unequivocally philosophical arguments, speculative, pure theoretical hypothesis. What happens is that they are inspired, polished, and continuously contrasted with data and studies that are nourished by social reality from an empirical point of view. And even so, it would not be accept acceptable for me to say that Hishman was an empiricist. I think he was not an empiricist. It's much complicated. <laughs> I believe I believe that in, in him, the self-subversion tendency was more profound than, than empiricism or simple em empiricism. And it is in this tendency, originally named by Hirschman to describe himself, this idea of self-subversion self in thinking, um, this, in, it is in this idea where we can find the key to the precise relationship between the speculative theoretical and the scientific empirical in him. His form of discourse was fundamentally speculative and his model of thought was that of classical philosophy. But his suspicion of all big ideas, the great systems of thought that become in transition because they pretend to always be consistent made him continuously attentive to the data of reality that could subvert his own ideas. The clearest, the clearest example, in my opinion, is in the sixth chapter of the rhetoric of reaction, famous sixth chapter. <laughs> After constructing an entire book in one direction, the critic of conservative thought, the author, Albert, the author himself shows in the penultimate chapter that the same phenomenon, reactionary thesis against change, can also be studied in an opposite ideology, the progressive one. That's self-subversion. He was, he was ending the book and he changed all the, the sense of the book. Uh, it is a matter of never being entirely content, content with what one's own theory, originally speculative, enunciates, and remaining attentive to reality to the point of being willing to put up with a new inconsistency in the theory in order to polish it, and so on again and again for a lifetime. At bottom, it is a matter of the need never to lose sight of contingent condition in which human action moves. That was what context what Lawrence was pointing. So you can always uh, be attentive to, to this contingent condition. You can always change your theory, as, as Shalini was, was uh, speaking with uh, Exit and Boys in the case of Sherman. He's, he was so, so, he has his, his eyes so open to new realities that he, 
he he make uh, a, a, a new contribution only by by changing the context, using the same theory with another context and and showing that it uh, it it still valid. So I think this this combination between speculative and empiricism in that way is something that uh, is a big heritage and, and we we can we can use it if we if we are able it's not easy thank you so yeah context matters uh complexity must be factored in and also there is this link between theory and practice i don't know lawrence if you'd like to elaborate on some of the aspects that for you are defining maybe uh yeah. approach maybe in this direction as I say, he was an economist too, uh, and um, while he was always a heterodox economist, um, and some difficulties I think arose from, in terms of his career because of the question, you know, if you're an economist, why aren't you being more of an economist and not doing these other things? Uh, but especially because of the purpose that I'm here for, which is to promote a conference on Hirschman and his contemporary relevance to public policy choices in Latin America today. Uh, it's worth going back and uh, underlining certain of the things that he was uh, contributing uh, in terms of uh, Latin American policy issues, things that one that, that are very much under uh, neglected, I would say, in the general memory of Hirschman, but that are things that I will encourage people to revisit and to um, uh, uh, update. Um, so, I mean, take a, a very simple, the very first thing he did, I think, in the early 1940s uh, uh, to establish himself as an economist was. Uh, at that time, not uh, uh, it, it was about um, the dynamics of trade, and whereas the standard liberal idea was, you know, <coughs> the more trade you have, the more benefit was generated, and the exchanges mean that both sides gain. Um, the experience of Nazism in the 1930s was very much that the dominant player might use their power to accumulate all the gain for themselves, not through mutually adjusting voluntary uh, trade, but through uh, dominance and the use of power to extract surplus and to monopolize it and to depossess, dispossess the other side. Um, and he, so he, he took that question, which is really, a big theoretical problem with classical economics. And he tried to extract some generalizations about international trade from that, which are subsequently became taken up by people like Prebisch in Argentina and the dependency school and so on, uh, along the lines, uh, he, he was against the dependency school, by the way. Uh, um, along the lines of, oh, we are being so dominated through international trade that we have to break with it, or... Uh, um. So the, the, the central argument that he put forward as early as the 1940s, and then it comes up again when he, when he revisits dependency theory and uh, a number of other issues like nationalization of foreign companies and so on, which are discussed, and he has important ideas about, and how to aid developing countries. All those economic questions, which are in the <coughs> 1960s, right now, the central objection he has is he's neither a Nazi nor a liberal, so what am I going to do intellectually to find uh, the trick, the key idea that um, explains what's going on and is neither of the above? Um, he, he, just very, very simply, if you take that um, uh, 
one party, let's call it the United States, is overwhelmingly powerful and prosperous, and a second party, let's call it Latin America, is in a very weak position, uh, only able to supply a limited range of uh, raw materials, which uh, it doesn't have any bargaining power about the price over, right? That looks like um, uh, an extremely uh, intolerable situation for which there is no, uh, as it were, easy remedy. But if you think sequentially over time, and if you look at the politics of the interaction between these two powers, what do you find? You find that the very powerful dominant state has many, many opportunities and alternatives and priorities to consider. And it isn't devoting all its energy to grinding the face of the poor in Latin America. It's, that ha may happen incidentally, but that's not really the principal driver of policy or the principal focus of what's going on. From the Latin America, or if we take the Latin American case, from the point of view of the, the victim in this unequal exchange, um, there isn't any wide diversity of other considerations. There is only one thing to deal with. How am I going to get myself out of this utterly unequal exchange? And to do that, all of my resources and all my energies will be focused on trying to get round the disadvantages, right? So what looks like in the first stage an impossible uh, um, injustice that can only lead to ever greater injustices turns into a dynamic interaction process in which the weaker party has some advantages, has some strategic opportunities and can, as it were, uh, analyse more closely than... I, 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 this may be too detailed, but I, it, it, it illustrates for me exactly what he was getting at. He didn't know about this particular study, but the Dominican Republic only produced sugar. The United States had a vast internal market for sugar and could choose where it got its cane sugar from and could dictate the price that it would get it from. But the United States is not really basically running the world on the basis of getting cheap sugar. That's just an incidental benefit of being in the United States. So the president of, of the Dominican Republic focuses attention, where is this sugar quota policy actually being determined? It's not being determined by the president of the United States. No good me going and complaining to the president about this. It's being determined by Congress. But it's not being determined by Congress. It's being determined by the Senate. But it's not being determined, which is the one that does the... Uh, uh, the, the, the trade. Um, but it's not being determined by the Senate, it's being determined by the Senate Agricultural Committee. Who is the chairman of the Senate Agricultural Committee and what other interests does he have? What kind of uh, bargain can I strike with this particular player that changes the dynamics to my advantage in the sugar trade? That's the sort of thing which is a reality easily passes below the radar, is fundamental for understanding what actually happened with the sugar quotas in the Caribbean in the 1950s. And although Hirschman did not, in fact, empirically study that case, um, his model, which was derived from thinking about German relations in the 1930s, fits it perfectly. And it's gone on a bit long. I did want to make two other points. Have we got time to make two other points? Right. One, that the unorthodoxy of Hirschman, his essays in trespassing and so on and so forth, is an expression of something which I think was already well advanced. Of course, it's his personal brilliance and so on, but well advanced and not confined to him, that there was a rich complex, sophisticated intellectual tradition in German 
intellectual thought, and particularly in the Weimar period, which had to force, you know, had to ask fundamental foundational questions about the assumptions of social life and so on, because what was happening in Germany with the collapse, collapse of the empire and the rise of Nazism and the possibility of a communist revolution and so on was so absolutely uh, traumatic and uh, beyond the range of normal expectations. It required you to go back and ask very fun foundational questions. So there was a body of brilliant people in Germany, a, a community, not just an individual, who, who, who were grappling with these things in a Weimar way of thinking. Very few of them survived because once Nazi power, the Nazis were out to distinct destroy um, uh, independent analytical thought of that kind. They had an answer which was not uh, an intellectually curious answer, shall we say. Uh, and they exterminated, I mean literally exterminated, and destroyed the, uh, the, the institutional foundations in which an alternative ways of thinking should be. And they particularly targeted the Jewish community, which was especially rich in thinking about these questions. And very, very few such people survived. Hirschman was really one of the very few. Another would be Hannah Arendt, and we can talk about a few others, who managed to get out. And they were the last residual legatees of this very rich intellectual tradition, which, of course, you know, I'm not saying that they, they drew on it rather than simply embodying it. Uh, uh, they brought it when they came to the United States. They were very successful. The United States welcomed them and accepted it in some ways. But it was not congruent with normal liberal ideological thinking in the US. It was quite incongruent, and therefore that you were always an outsider, you were always heterodox, you were always not playing by the conventional rules of intellectual life in, the, I'd say, the Anglo-Saxon world. I don't just mean the US in Britain, the same point in some Maybe, Lawrence, I wouldn't, sorry to interrupt, yeah. I would build on that for Shalini, because right. also for the, I, I'm seeing that time is... Uh, sorry. <laughs> I, and because I think that point could uh, be elaborated also from a perspective of, you know, you, you are very well illustrated, I think, uh, Hirschman's, you know, trajectory from economics to politics and, and so on. And, and maybe, Shalini, if you could elaborate on the, the, the boundaries, including the disciplinary boundaries that Hirschman has kind of traced past. So very quickly, just let me make uh, uh, three points. Let me pick up on Santiago's point about uh, one very characteristic feature of Hirschman's thought is uh, starting not from grand ideas, but from very small ideas. And uh, he says it often in interviews, but when we were in Berlin together also, he, he would say, I, there are two ideas which are very important, which I got from my brother-in-law. So if we think about not just the Weimar tradition, but who is the other major intellectual influence on Albert Hirschman's life, it's Eugenio Colorni. This is the husband of his elder sister, Ursula, to whom he's very, very close. He's very close to Ursula, but he was also very close to Eugenio. And Colony was killed. He was murdered by the fascists in Italy. But before he was murdered, Albert was um, uh, in exile in Italy, and he was able to spend a lot of time with him. So he said, often, he said, one thing I learned from Eugenio was uh, that small ideas are the lens to understand very large conditions and questions. And the other thing he used to say was, what I learned from him was trust in doubt. <laughs> and trust in doubt is a very interesting formulation because what he meant was he said Colorney and his group were always searching for the truth, but they always continued to doubt whatever conclusion they came to. And so it's a, it's a attitude, it's an intellectual stance which he really incorporated very strongly. 
The trespassing of boundaries and disciplines, uh, which you alluded to, uh, Christine, I think it's uh, multiple. I think we've all uh, talked about how uh, it's very difficult to classify um, his work as belonging to a discipline. I mean, he was a very um, uh, uh, well-trained, um, but actually self-trained economist. Um, and uh, he then trespassed without any difficulty into uh, political um, uh, theory, into uh, sociological um, um, uh, ideas. But for me, the two interesting things uh, were, one, how much he uses literature in all his subsequent writings. In the early writings, which are proper books, um, he doesn't as much, but the second part of his life is devoted almost to a genre of writing, which are essays. And uh, the essay form becomes for him the most uh, chosen form of um, writing. And all of those essays start with an epithet and they're very much about using literature. And the elegance of that writing is really saturated with a literary. Uh, imagination and you can see that you know German is his mother tongue he has French almost um, uh, a native uh, fluency because he went to the French in, in Berlin English is his fourth language he learns Italian before that but in between he learns Spanish and Portuguese but then he learns English and then he writes in English so he's trespassing linguistic boundaries disciplinary boundaries crisscrossing using literature on, on from all of these different uh, languages, disciplines. So there is a, uh, I would say in addition to the Weimar scholarship, there is a deep humanism, European humanism to his scholarship, which I think is something really characteristic of his writing. And on the essay form, and then I just stopped with that. So uh, those of you who know uh, Albert's um, life, you know, that he was, um, uh, after a short, very short period, fighting in the Spanish Civil War. He's then in Italy um, uh, with uh, Colonna. He gets his PhD from Trieste. Um, he then leaves Italy because of the fascist, um, uh, uh, you know, takeover. And he's in occupied France. And then he's in Marseille. Um, working with Perry and Fry, and he works for the rescue committee. He's the one who is helping Hannah Arendt um, and people to escape, finally. And he he's, uh, has several forged passports, but because he's a uh, native fluent in Italian, German, and French, he has three identities, and he has three forged passports, and he's going using all these passports, uh, helping people. And then it becomes uh, too close for comfort, and he walks over the Pyrenees um, uh, and uh, finally uh, emigrates to the uh, US uh, by Lisbon. So once when we were having lunch in Wissenschaft's colleague, one of the questions uh, somebody Madame, asked Monsieur, him. Je vous informe que la bibliothèque a fermé ses portes dans 15 minutes. Nous allons nous diriger vers la porte de sortie. Si vous avez des documents à emprunter, veuillez le faire dès à présent. Merci pour votre attention. Je vous souhaite une excellente soirée. So one of the questions someone asked him at the lunch table was, and I was just listening to the conversation. What is the one book you would take with you when you were crossing the Pyrenees? And he said, Montaigne's Essays. And Montaigne was a very, very big influence on his writing and his thinking and his style of writing. And um, I think it's, it's good to remember that when you're reading him because it gives you a very deep insight into the kinds of um, uh, uh, things, uh, including a lot of self-reflection in those essays. And then let me just say something on the complexity question, because you know, usually, and he has a very interesting essay called Against Parsimony. And he's very, uh, he's really a, a, a very scathing attack on economists for what he thinks is too much parsimony. And he thinks this is just totally counterproductive. So he's very much for complexity and context. But it's two kinds of complexity, and I think that's why Montaigne is very interesting here. It's not only the complexity of social life, which we've all talked about in political life, economic life, etc., but the complexity of the human condition and of human life.
Because if you read the essays, that is where you see how much the formation is from Montaigne, the idea that human beings are extraordinarily complex. And if we want to understand society, we cannot reduce them, as economists are tend, uh, tend to do, into just individual self-interested uh, monastic um, uh, individuals. So I think a lot of um, the richness um, and, uh, for me, the, the absolute brilliance of the essays uh, comes from exactly that kind of background and formation. Uh, may I say something? Sure, sure. I think I, I love that, that background and what, what he does in, in, in essays. And, uh, and, but I think that the, the use of classical uh, literature has some, I don't know if you will agree, but some ironic or sarcastic thing because sometimes he's criticizing without saying um, some kind of adanism in social sciences that think that they are discovering something very subtle and special and he gets there and say Chekhov has said or Goethe has said or Montaigne has he uses all the time, for example, when he's um, discussing with Mar Monk Rose on uh, yes. uh, logic, logic of collective action, action. The, the, his, his word <laughs> to fight with him is Pascal, yeah. not uh, a, new, a new political scientist, or yes. it's a, a pensée from Pascal. Yeah. So he, he was, I think he, he was a bit critical of these uh, people thinking that they are inventing all the time new big ideas. When, if you have read uh, classical uh, literature, you know the same. But I think that's very much because he's so interested in the complexity of human condition, right? Ah, it is. I think that is where I, and I think you're absolutely right. And he goes back to classical texts, he goes to new ones. But just so that, uh, you know, um, because uh, this is in the context of the Democracy Institute, he has a very interesting essay called Opinionated Opinions, right? And Opinionated Opinions is on democracy, right? But the essay is all about Jane Austen. And uh, so you can you can see how he uses um, uh, Jane Austen's example to make the case for why opinionated opinions are or not a good idea for democracy. But he does it through a very circuitous route, which is very much about how human beings uh, think and feel contradiction. and uh, contradiction and complexity. And I think that's, that there is something very, very, very interesting uh, there. Thank you. So I, I think the, the theme that uh, also Lawrence mentioned earlier, that we are really interested in exploring together also during the international workshops that we are organizing together is how, to what extent, can Albert Hishman's work um, inspire and be used to grasp and address current contemporary challenges. So I, I, I won't ask you the, the, the question directly now, also for the uh, time constraints that we have, although I would ask you to relate some of the audience question that we might have have to these kind of aspect that we would like to further explore today and also in the coming days. So let me open the room for uh, questions or comments from the room if you, if you have. Janina, do we have a mic, uh, Michelle? Yes. Thank you. And then I see you. So let, let us take three questions in Laura. Hopefully we have a mic. Uh, uh, I just have to. Yeah, it works. Yeah, quick question because I think we are running out of time. A wonderful conversation. I really enjoy listening your uh, your thoughts and your experience with Hirschman. And my question is to Lawrence, and it's about transitions. 
because uh, yeah, as you said, you were one of the main promoters of these works on transition from authoritarian rule. And yeah, one of the basic elements of this work is the identification of conditions for transitions. And Hirschman said something like, transitions should be thought as constellation of rare events in place of something related to conditions. And in fact, if I re remember well, in, in, a, in an article in the New Yorker Review, he wrote about the case of Argentina, where he said none of these conditions were really present, but the transition happened and the regime stayed. So my question is, how do you read now this criticism uh, or, yeah, it's a criticism on, on your own thoughts on the transitions. And I have more questions. Thank you. Then we have a question there, and then Laura. We take three, and then the next round. Yeah. Uh, hi. A, um, an awfully theoretical question um, to uh, Mr. Whitehead. Um, you mentioned uh, a cause can have an equal and opposite, a uh, two equal and opposite um, impacts. Wouldn't that make it the cause make the cause uh, in imperceivable? <laughs> uh, so therefore, it would only be perceived via the 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 asymmetrical interactions of those two opposite impacts with other things. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for the fascinating uh, discussion. I wanted to come back to a theme that all three of you have uh, touched upon, which is Hirschman's inter interdisciplinarity. So you've talked a bit about some of the hurdles he may have faced, uh, where the intellectual tradition it comes from, etc. Um, we all know how difficult interdisciplinary is to do in an academic setting with you know strong disciplinary boundaries, etc. Is there something we can learn from his career when in doing interdisciplinarity? Um, this is a question, I suppose, for all of the panelists, perhaps Santiago or Shalini. Thank you. Lawrence, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, on the transition, sorry, for Janina, on the transition. Uh, uh, on the transition. This is the problem. That's all right. Okay, now? Uh, on the transitions point, um, he, uh, just there isn't a, the key idea, uh, from the Hirschman side, the key idea is possibilism. Um, it's, the, it's that uh, all sorts of things are possible. Uh, we shouldn't be tied to the social science mantra about prediction as the test of scientific certainty. We should entertain the possibility, given that we're we're uh, allowed to adopt a standpoint where we would be interested in something happening and then we have to be cool and clear and logical about the conditions under which it happens and so on. That obviously does raise the possibility that you end up saying um, all these conditions are required and Argentina doesn't meet any of them so it's not going to happen. But that would be a prediction. He's against predictions. He's in favor of entertaining with doubt, you know. Even though the conditions don't appear to exist, uh, uh, it's, you still can't be sure that it's impossible. And that's because of, uh, I mean, other things in his theory, which include, um, the, 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 you can't analyze macro processes solely at the level of macro factors. There are micro uh, foundations. Uh, and the micro foundations, as I illustrated with the point about, you know, the apparently 
unequal power between the US and the Dominican Republic. But there's a, there's a little highly motivated actor that can analyze that and change the terms of the relationship. So um, I would say that the Transitions Project was uh, in keeping with Hirschmanian thought because uh, uh, it was directed against dominant explanations of democracy in terms of preconditions. We were not saying you have to meet these preconditions. Instead, it was saying, we don't know whether this is bound to happen. We think it's possible that it could happen. And it's worth thinking through the dynamics through which this possibility might be realized and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and it's elsewhere, I think, other people have uh, said this, but we were also very influenced by Machiavelli in this respect. Um, so that's as much as I can say on that point. Now, if I, I just produced the throwaway line because it was what Hirschman said to me about uh, a single course can produce two equal and opposite effects. Um, in pure abstract, you are right, but if you only have uh, one cause and two effects, and the two effects are equal and opposite, uh, you don't even know you've got a cause because you can't see an outcome. That's what you're saying. That wasn't really what I think my interpretation of what he was saying. He was saying causal models which are overconfident about the chain of direction uh, are um, liable to go wrong because uh, the countervailing effect, uh, let's say, uh, I'm not sure whether this would be one of his examples, but to, you know, if you, if you say I am Fukuyama and I know that history has come to an end <laughs> and that there is only one future for, liberal, for the world, which is liberal democracy, that would be the kind of thing where he'd say, well, uh, you know, there are two <laughs> results rather than one. They don't necessarily happen at the same time, but uh, the extraordinary ambition and relentlessness of that claim inspires an equal and opposite reaction. Look at Russia, China, and so on, you know. It may take it time. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the underlying cause was not there and did not produce effects, but the effects do not correspond in a permanent and uh, relentless way to what the causal model would suggest. That's, I think, what he was that, getting at. That end of history at uh, Fukushima, it's what he would have called a big idea in a bad sense, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So that's the third, the interdisciplinary, <laughs> interdisciplinarity. What can we learn from his career? Well, I mean, it's the same question that keeps uh, affecting academics generation after generation and so on. Your claim, why it's worth doing the study and collecting the evidence and do dominating the complex methods and so on, is that you're going to, in the end, at the least, improve understanding as compared to people who haven't done your research and your disciplinary uh, scholarship. Um, that ultimately has to either be true or not true. If uh, by the relentless pursuit of, let's call it the Fukuyama claim, or let's call it the Rusto model, or whatever it is, you get further and further away from understanding what's happening to democracy around the world, or what's happening to economic growth around the world, um, then your discipline is bankrupt. That's the fact of the matter. Uh, and, and in the end, I mean, it may take an awful long time. If, you're, if, if your discipline is bankrupt, the problem that the discipline is failing to explain is going to have to be explained in some other way. And your, your discipline is going to uh, be uh, rendered useless. And some other approach, which might not be perfect either, is going to become the explanatory um, uh, 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 procedure 
that is socially and intellectually acceptable. So interdisciplinarity is uh, a bit like we've been saying about the essays and the, uh, uh, the trespassing and so on, is that arrière-pensée, perhaps I take this model just as far as it can go, but I always keep going back and checking, <laughs> is it working? Is there something else that would do better? What is the alternative, you see? And that might be within my discipline, I can improve my discipline, or it might actually be uh, that I have to use a different discipline entirely. Um, that doesn't solve individual academics <laughs> career problems, <laughs> but that's what the enterprise of understanding requires. Alini. So very, I mean, my flippant answer to you would be to say the lesson to be learned is however brilliant you are, you don't get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what happened to him. I think he more than deserved the Nobel Prize and the economists would not consider him one of their own. But what you do see in his career is a transition. So in the early works, he is an economist. Mm -hmm. He's disagreeing with a lot of his fellow economists, but he is actually practicing the trade uh, <clears throat> in very, very um, uh, disciplinary. Uh, Lee, um, um, uh, how should I say? I don't want to use the word orthodox, but uh, um, uh, in, a, in a fashion which would be actually using the tools of his discipline or all the earlier books. And even with strategies of economic development, etc., he's disagreeing with a lot of orthodoxy, uh, but he's still uh, sort of up to a point, very much an economist. Um, he uh, is at loggerheads with many of them. And I think uh, Santiago is absolutely right. Uh, in the early works, it's not the case, but later, the irony is one of his modes of uh, actually very subtle, um, uh, uh, you know, disagreement uh, with uh, his colleagues and one. And then in the later works, he's no longer interested in, uh, so he's published a lot in academic journals as well. Uh, so he has that side to him. And then, uh, you know, in the later years, um, uh, especially once he's at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, uh, you know, he doesn't have a university career, don't forget. They don't give him professorships. And if they offer it to him, he's not really interested because he said once to me, Shalini, when I said, he said, what do you like about your job? I said, I love teaching. He says, one thing I didn't enjoy. He didn't like teaching in the classroom. And uh, so he never had a straightforward uh, uh, university uh, career. Uh, but for that, he had one of the most prestigious positions in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. And that gave him total freedom, right, to, to trespass in any direction which he wanted. And the essays are, of course, no longer pigeonholed into any disciplinary category. So I think it's also, one has to see that there is, a, a, from, from the career point of view also, there is a, a development. Uh, Santiago. Very shortly, eh? about, about career, I don't know if it's worth it being useful for the career, but I would say you can learn from him to always run away from fatalistic temptations when, when you are studying anything and, and try to look to a non-fatalistic approach to anything. Because fatalistic approach is a temptation. I think it's like a natural temptation in sociology and politics. It's the, it's the most common uh, temptation. And in that uh, issue, he, he was incredibly potent in running away from, from fatalistic uh, approaches. I would love him to, to, to be here thinking, for example, about the internet. And instead of saying it is destroying our democracy and that kind of things, what, what he would do?
to run away from a fatalistic uh, approach to think internet. Thank you so much to all of you. And we unfortunately we are running out of time. It's, uh, we have it's to close awful. here. Uh, and you have made the connection again to the bias for hope that we are bringing and we hope to bring in, uh, in the workshop and in other activities at the center and also in collaboration uh, with uh, our partners at Oxford uh, and beyond. And I just wanted